Thank you and welcome to everyone uh, to tonight's constitutional conversation uh, with our guest, uh, Professor Alex Sessis uh, from Loyola University in Chicago. I've known Alex, I don't know, we've been, he, he's one of the most fascinating people to, to discuss controversial ideas with that I have uh, known and we've been tossing things around for probably 20 years or so, 20, 25 years. And we've invited him tonight uh, to speak about his uh, book, uh, Free Speech and the Balance. Now, Alex, you need to understand about Alex is that he is uh, one of our nation's leading experts, especially on the 13th Amendment, but in general on the uh, civil rights amendments and uh, enforcement. Uh, and this is his uh, opportunity opportunity to talk about and what I think is an increasingly important and controversial uh, intersection uh, between uh, civil rights uh, and freedom of speech. And before turning it over to him, I want to apologize for the lateness, which was my uh, entirely the fault of my techno incompetence, as I didn't, um, I had uh, neglected to pay close attention to the unique Zoom link and was trying to get in uh, uh, in, uh, in other ways. So anyway, my fault for starting late, but I'm not going to waste any more of your time or Alex's. Uh, so welcome, help join me please in welcoming uh, Alex Sessis uh, to this night's uh, constitutional conversation. Thank you so much, Michael. I'm deeply grateful to you and to Morgan Whalen for this opportunity in this pandemic time. It's such a joy to be able to engage in an intellectual conversation. Uh, it's something that we're so short of. And of course, the joy of spending time with students is, is in and of itself something that's very special. But uh, this sort of uh, uh, event where we can talk about ideas, uh, really give something that is so wanting in this uh, time when so much is on computer. But here is this great vehicle for discussing things at long distance. So uh, let me begin. First of all, uh, uh, I, I mentioned to Michael before the beginning, uh, Professor McConnell's written a great book called The President Who Would Not Be King about the executive power that I've just finished. It just came out and I highly recommend it to everybody. Um, and uh, he, I'm uh, a fan of his work, have cited to it often, and his influence is just vast. And we're so lucky that he's back in the academy and uh, uh, engaging in ideas in, in, in such fresh ways that is moving the dialogue along. This, this book, The President Who Would Not Be King, begins at the time of the Philadelphia Constitutional Drafting Convention and goes all the way through the Trump administration. So. That is, is a real a gift to our entire uh, community in, in the academy and beyond to educated readers. So uh, with that, uh, let me go ahead and begin on discussing my book, Free Speech and the Balance. Um, I wanted to note the book, uh, Cambridge is coming out with the paperback edition. If people are interested in the book, that would be the more inexpensive way of buying it. The hardcover is mostly geared towards uh, libraries. And so it's available uh, in paperback at a much more reasonable price. So be careful, don't go for that real expensive one. Free speech is critical to Republican governance. It makes democracy ring out here and abroad. The constitutional liberty to hold, express, and listen to ideas is invaluable. For disseminating public and private views, debating ideas, spreading information, enriching culture, and associating with those who are like-minded. The constitutional guarantee of free speech serves political and autonomous needs, empowering individuals to pursue their unique quest for happiness and their communal, civic, and political mindedness. Judicial evaluation of competing interests is often necessary for a just resolution of cases addressing the nation's thorniest problems, such as campaign financing, foreign and domestic terrorist threats, and digital recordings of police conduct. All these involve a variety of factors, politicking versus anti-corruption measures, catharsis versus safety, and transparency versus efficiency. In my book, Free Speech and the Balance, I propose a rigorous multifactorial test 
requiring judges to evaluate whether any relevant expressive interests are likely to result in constitutional, statutory, or common law injuries, what historical or traditional considerations are at play, whether there are countervailing government interests, whether the regulation meets appropriate means ends assessments, and whether there are any less restrictive means for achieving underlying policies that would leave the speech at issue unencumbered. The balancing model proposed in free speech and the balance runs counter to American libertarian free speech ideology and especially criticizes the court's recent Lochnerian moralizing from the bench. Of course, not all claims about free speech are convincing. Sometimes people in organization turn to the First Amendment to advance only tangentially related concerns. They bolster deregulatory arguments by invoking the First Amendment, sometimes making frivolous claims. Professor Fred Schauer has documented how free speech clause has uh, recently been invoked to challenge financial disclosure, conflicts of interest between medical researchers and pharmaceutical companies, professional standards for therapists, anti-competitive franchise agreements, bond and credit ratings, health regulations on tattoo parlors, mandates on post-fair uh, labor notices and so on. Schauer, Schauer rightly calls this manipulation of doctrine First Amendment opportunism. Courts increasingly rely on the most exacting scrutiny to review content-based regulations. My book, Free Speech in the Balance, seeks to demonstrate the extent to which the free speech clause in the First Amendment is part of a broader constitutional scheme. It, it, that scheme I fleshed out in a, my previous book, Constitutional Ethos. So I won't go into that in, in greater depth at this time in the interest of what the limited space we have. That constitutional scheme though requires the court reviewing a statute implicating communications to examine relevant speaker and audience interests, countervailing government concerns, means ends fits, alternatives for communications and historically relevant guidance. The value of speech is self-expression, political engagement, and factual information. The second part of the book applies this proportionality analysis to a variety of areas, including campaign finance reform, incitement, true threats, public school students' communications, and to terrorist incitement on the internet. I'm glad to go into these issues during Q&A, but for this evening, I want to concentrate my remarks on free speech theory. Um, why is this topic relevant? Well, I wrote this book to address an increasing judicial formalism that threatens to upend health and safety regulations under the guise of First Amendment jurisprudence. In a case striking a law that had prohibited the distribution of violent videos depicting animal cruelty, a case called United States versus Stevens, Chief Justice John Roberts rejected what he called ad hoc balancing of relative social costs and benefits with speech in, case, this, in, in those cases where there was some communication. Roberts refused to defer to a bipartisan Congress, which had passed a law consistent with the animal cruelty statutes in all 50 states. Federalism does not even appear in his opinion. It is an opinion of pure judicial will. The chief's efforts at history are almost entirely misstated and rely on another historical error introduced into the case law by Justice Scalia in a St. Paul, Minnesota cross burning case. The result is a formalistic holding in Stevens that is result oriented. For one, Chief Justice Roberts is wrong as a matter of history, asserting in Stevens that 1791, the year that the Bill of Rights was ratified is determinative as to whether a form of speech is protected under the First Amendment or of such low value as to enjoy 
no constitutional protection. Of low value speech, he lists only fraud in 1791 had been a category recognized to be outside the First Amendment scope. The other categories that he lists, including child pornography, incitement, and um, uh, um, uh, constitutional defamation, didn't exist in 1791 at all. Child pornography was uh, a doctrine and a, a category created in 1982, constitutional defamation 1964, and incitement 1919. So the chief's reference to 1791 fails. The court next relied on its formalistic categorical approach in Brown versus Entertainment Merchants Association, which struck down a state statute prohibiting the sale or rental of violent video games to minors. Here too, the court with Justice Scalia writing for the majority found that low value categories of expression could be traced to the ratification of the Bill of Rights. As in Stevens, that claim inaccurately described history. Among the low value categories listed in that case, suppo supposedly already existing in 1791, were obscenity in 1957, which is not even the case that Scalia should have been citing. He should have been citing Miller versus California, but that's a 1973 case. Incitement, which is Brandenburg, that's 1969. And fighting words, which are another low value category, but from 1942. Thereby, Stevens and Entertainment Merchants Association significantly raised the bar for health and safety regulations that they must meet when the law is even incidentally uh, connected with speech. Next is Reed versus Town of Gilbert. The holding in this case is that strict scrutiny, which is the highest level in which the court will question what uh, Congress has done, should be used for all content related uh, legislation. It's the case is contrary to precedent, which is just commercial speech precedent, inconsistent with stare decisis. Uh, this is Reed versus Town of Gilbert. Its holding elevates judicial supremacism in the guise of libertarian textualism that is reminiscent, reminiscent to the formalism associated with the Lochner era. And I want to remark here about Morgan Whalen's exceptional article on this point, expanding the periphery and threatening the core, ascendancy of libertarian speech tradition. Uh, uh, Morgan's uh, article, which appeared in the Stanford Law Review, and she's now director at the Constitutional Law Center, is much uh, 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 reading that should be required in courses on the First Amendment and in its recent emendations. So now I want to turn with uh, this approach and, and discuss how pertinent values are closely related to the interpretive balancing around the world. This is something that comparative studies will show that proportionality is used in countries and other democracies like Canada, Great Britain, Australia, Israel, Belgium, Germany, Iceland, and other uh, countries that uh, are contrary to the way that the United States approaches the issues. I spend an entire chapter comparing US law with other countries' approaches, and I don't wanna spend much time on it tonight. Contrary to the court's re assertion in Reed, not all speech other than a few categories purported, purportedly created in 1791 should be subject to strict judicial review. There are in reality many content and viewpoint based regulations that are not subject to the First Amendment precisely because they involve other weighty concerns. I'm referring to content based laws such as rules of evidence, rules of professional conduct, especially those that govern lawyers and physicians, criminal procedures, prohibitions against material support of terrorism, copyright protections, antitrust laws, and campaigning by polling booths on the day of election. All these require judicial review of content and the many implicate restrictions on viewpoint. I cannot reveal insider stock information to a friend even though I know that as a listener, he is interested to know my insider views on how to make out on the stock market. Nor can a physician follow a course of medical mismanagement, say pushing hydro hydroxychloroquine as a treatment for COVID-19 without exposing them himself to professional liability. 
Moreover, felony laws prohibiting one from falsely holding out to be a physician, lawyer, accountant, engineer, police officer, and otherwise a, a member of a licensed profession are expressly content and viewpoint specific. Indeed, they all involve prior restraints. They bar people representing themselves to be members of a profession subject to special social trusts based on accurate and beneficial expertise. Resort to legal rules will rarely provide unequivocal answers to litigation involving free speech, particularly when the enumerated provision is as ambiguously drafted as the free speech clause. A judge's role is to identify the reason through multiple principles, which themselves are based on social norms. Such a weighing of concerns is needed, for instance, when courts face conflicting values, such as free speech and privacy, or vitriolic political debate and the interest of public reputation. Free speech issues are particularly complex and better resolved by standards rather than absolute rules because they involve so many strands of private, civic, informational, and public uh, issues. Take fraud, for example, which is not protected by the First Amendment because tort feasors violate public and private confidence. The law gives great, greater weight to the victim's losses. The deception perpetrated against others may well give the speaker, whether political or private, advantage and thereby promote his or her liberty. Money, after all, employed for truthful or deceptive endeavors gives one great autonomy. For, but fair dealing requires government to provide a remedy against misleading business transactions. A countervailing social value therefore outweighs the speech interest in defrauding, which may not be de minimis. Balancing analysis requires reflection on the specific speech interest, the countervailing government concern, the means used and the legitimacy of the end sought, av availability of alternative expressions and history too is critical for assessing the validity of a law. It is undeniable that cases decided through balancing just as those decided through First Amendment formalism will remain contestable, but at least standards provide guidance for lower courts and enrich existing doctrine. The Stevens and Reed libertarian line of cases tend to skew the complexity of free speech analysis. Any balancing already has a strong grounding in free speech law under the O'Brien test. It's a balancing test that, is, uh, that gives uh, the opportunity to consider health and safety regulations as well. The secondary effects test uh, to zoning adult theaters is undeniably content-based. It allows states to limit where adult theaters can be located, just as Stevens has pointed that out. And the Supreme Court's willing willingness to uphold restrictions on those who want to approach a woman seeking abortion services is likewise arguably content-based as Justice Scalia has pointed out. These and other examples demonstrate that the court is disingenuine in arguing that strict scrutiny applies to all content-based regulations other than low value categories dating back to 1791. I wanna now show that there are multiple examines examples in which the court prior to this libertarian turn has balanced other considerations with free speech. Kovacs versus Cooper was a case that upheld a city ordinance from Trenton, New Jersey, uh, limiting loud and raucous noises. In contemporary times, we would call this a time, place, and manner restriction. And the court said that there were countervailing concerns to those who wanted to be very loud in the streets. Those were health, morals, safety, and the well-being and tranquility of the community. In a case uh, called uh, Taxpayers versus Vincent's, the court said even aesthetics, that is to say street cleanliness, rather than a bunch of handbills lying around on the ground with information about a political candidate, had a significant 
in, had a significant were a significant countervailing concern for the government to limit uh, litter in the streets. In a case that uh, Professor McConnell argument argued before the Supreme Court, one of his cases that he argued before the Supreme Court called Martinez, a long uh, plaintiff or, or a petitioner name in Martinez, a student organization brought a 1983 claim saying that they should be able to have, um, uh, uh, that they should not need to comply with the non-discriminatory policies of a public university. The court found it was a limited forum and that the uh, university could actually make reasonable and viewpoint neutral concerns. But it didn't go into all the depth of principles that were involved. And here's what I mean. The balance could have been much greater concerning free exercise of religion and free association, something that would have been very helpful had the court been clear on that those issues because Masterpiece Cake Shop which uh, where a, a person argued that he did not, does not need to make a cake for a gay and uh, couple that could have helped to explain and to interpret that case. And as that goes forward, Lawrence v. Texas, the case dealing with dignity and sexuality could have been brought up. There were other principles such as uh, anti-discrimination principles the court didn't discuss. Education was not discussed in the Martinez case. Uh, laws of general applicability, anti-discrimination laws, that is, which whether they should apply across the board, even in matters where people's religions, convictions differ. Uh, and so that uh, could have been, uh, I think, much greater depth could have been provided there. But the court did balance in Holder versus Humanitarian Law Project, in which it found that the material uh, support for terrorist statute was constitutional as well as another case where it found that judicial integrity was more important than a, a right of a judicial candidate to be able to solicit funds from donors. Lane v. Franks found that in on balance, the interest of a court to hear from a witness was greater than the government's interest to suppress the individual speech. And of course, a famous case called Burson versus Freeman where the court said that uh, speech within a hundred feet of a polling station could be limited in order to avoid antagonism of would-be voters. Even the case that's really the quintessential case on uh, um, uh, uh, protections of free speech, the Pentagon paper case, which uh, prohibits what is the most suspect of all restrictions on speech, the most, as the court called it, heavily presumed against constitutional validity of any restrictions on speech. The Pentagon Papers case itself has balancing where it, it, all but Justice Black really talk about things like inevitable and direct and immediate dangers, such as people in the press set, putting out information about transport at sea, uh, and saying that even under those circumstances, there might be a right to prior restraint of not identifying the military's movement uh, to the enemy. Uh, and uh, the same can be said about other uh, justices in the Pentagon Papers case that spoke about uh, the potential of restrictions where there's a grave and irreparable injury that's possible. Now, what about cases that I want to bring out and say, that the court did not do enough balancing. And I, there are other examples I can bring up later in the discussion, and I will bring up later in the discussion, and then of course in the Q&A if people are interested in it, but I'll just bring a few in where I think the court was far too categorical. One is a case called Panette, in which a Ku Klux Klan uh, cross was put up in a park, and the question was whether the private expression, since the Klan put it up, was protected in this public space. The court said it was protected. Justice Scalia writing in the majority characterized it as pub private religious speech protected by the First Amendment. But there's no discussion of any other principles and particularly the 13th Amendment principle which Professor McConnell mentioned that I've written quite a bit on that prohibits the badges of slavery or involuntary servitude, at least arguably the Klan the Klan's cross, even when it's not burning, might be said to be a badge of slavery. In McCullen versus Connolly, the court found that the state had uh, made the zone where individuals could approach a woman 
seeking an abortion at an abortion center that the law was too narrowly drawn. It didn't allow the would-be speakers to approach her close enough. But in the entire opinion, in the entire opinion, there's no discussion of a woman's right to privacy. There's no mention of Planned Parenthood v. Casey. There's no mention of Roe v. Wade, as if those values didn't matter. RAV versus St. Paul, a case dealing with uh, cross burning, did it also it had virtually no discussion of uh, other principles, something that Justice White and Justice Stevens discussed in their, in their um, uh, concurrences to the case. Uh, and then also in the copyright cases, these are cases where the court has refused to look at First Amendment principles and has isolated them and said that they are protected by the uh, fair use and the ideas expressions dichotomy. The, there's no need to look at whether or not restrictions on copyright are restrictions on speech and therefore has expanded the length of time on the protection of copyright, which has limited the works available in uh, the public forum. This is a case called Golan versus Holden and another one called Elder versus Ashcroft. So uh, the final portion of this uh, 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 presentation, I want to just discuss the Roberts Court and the direction I think that it's headed in. Cases, uh, communications is neither simply about individual interests nor about associational rights. Cases in the free speech area of law are a tangle of personal and group values. Each case, as Justice Brennan wrote in his opinion in the flag burning case, Texas v. Johnson, requires careful consideration of actual circumstances surrounding such expression. The reach of First Amendment protections should not be simply defined through categories in existence when national, the nation ratified the Bill of Rights in 1791, as Justice, Chief Justice Roberts said in Stevens, but through proportional analysis of speech interests, countervailing government concerns, the likelihood that the regulation will accomplish legitimate policies, less restrictive regulatory alternatives, doctrines relevant to adjudication and the aspirations of a free and equal people. The Roberts Court majority, as Justice Kagan has intimated, has turned the First Amendment into a judicial foil against legislative efforts to protect individual rights and advance general welfare concerns through economic and regulatory policies. The court aggressively wields the First Amendment to strike legislative priorities in a manner reminiscent of a bygone era, something out of the Gilded Age, when the court sought to remake social policy through doctrine, doctrine and fall modesty. A balance of values, speech rights, government purposes, and narrowly tailored laws would better provide the context for interpreting cases challenging restrictions on communications. Instead, the court has repeatedly demonstrated preference for commercial vendors over government regulators. In the past decade, the Roberts majority has tended to automatically elevate the value of speech above other public policy concerns. For example, in Sorrell versus IMS Health, the court struck a state's consumer privacy law in favor of pharmaceutical corporate profit from an unregulated trade in personal patient data. Speech, as Justice Kagan said, is everywhere. It's a part of all human activity, employment, healthcare, security trading. For that reason, almost all economic regulation will involve some degree of speech. And at every stop, the citizen who tries to pass law through his legislator meets black robed rulers overriding the citizen's choice. The free speech clause has thus become a deregulatory tool against privacy regulation. In another recent opinion favorable to corporate centered under, uh, understanding of the free speech clause, Janus, the Roberts court struck labor laws designed to facilitate collective bargaining. The contextual method my book, Free Speech and the Balance, calls for is not novel. Proportional analysis of constitutional value is the staple of democracies throughout the world. 
Professor Vicki Jackson has pointed out that proportionality offers some hope of more careful and open reasoning about constitutional values. As I mentioned earlier tonight, and the book discusses at length, democracies around the world rely on proportional approaches. To the contrary, the Roberts Court is keen on formalistic interpretation. The court regularly oversimplifies cases by relying on a misleading speech, not speech dichotomy. Take, for example, the court's use of strict scrutiny in Citizens United, the case that equated corporate expenditures on elections with human speech. The holding protected voters' access to pertinent information is true, but it severely underplayed the appearance of corruption that accompanies corporate expenditures amounting to millions upon millions of dollars on electing favorable political candidates. The majority was entirely dismissive of election concerns other than quid pro quo variety of bribery. And in reconfirming, it reconfirmed uh, what formalistic holding more recently in McCutcheon, which found that aggregation provisions of the Bipartisan Campaign Reform Act to also be unconstitutional. Likewise, Sorrell, that's the data privacy case I mentioned just a minute ago, recognized the need for information about pharmaceutical products, but out of hand rejected state concerns for keeping healthcare information from profit-seeking corporation fixating on marketing the expensive drugs rather than the dignity of maintaining healthcare anonymity. The proposal for contextualization in my book requires no ad hoc balancing, calling for instead for reasoned judgment, arguing for explicit analysis of private and public interests at stake, means used and ends sought, available alternative channels for communication and historically relevant information. The court's increasingly absolutist uh, sounding free speech reasoning also appeared in a case called Nifla versus Becerra, a case from a couple of years ago, which found unconstitutional a state statute that required public health information uh, to be posted by licensed and unlicensed crisis pregnancy centers. The state crafted notices were neutral, although they were clearly meant to inform women of a range of prenatal options, including abortions. Relying on strict scrutiny, the court held the mandated notices unconstitutionally intruded into the crisis center's speech interests, thereby preventing the state from providing mandatory healthcare information. The NIFLA rationale threatens to bring a vast array of government notice requirements under the rubric of free speech, including pharmaceutical information, uh, warnings on tobacco labels, and so on. Historically, courts have deferred to reasonable judgments of medical professionals and healthcare officials to set safety and health standards, not judges in black robes. Even a transactional regulatory requirement to post information, post information about differences between credit and cash pricing, a statute about you must post information about how much difference you would have to pay if you paid in cash as opposed to credit card was also found to be unconstitutional under First Amendment review, a case called Expressive Expressions Hair Designs versus Schneiderman. Decisions that fail to carefully parse all relevant constitutional considerations, including federalism, equal protection, and due process, appear to be outcome determinative. In recent times, the court has preferred free speech claims instead of balancing the value of public policies to consumer confidence, patient privacy, collective bargaining, electoral confidence, hateful incitements, educational liberty, and election integrity. Better would be for courts to balance free speech interests, countervailing government concerns, means ends considerations, alternatives for communications, and historically relevant information. With that, I thank you and uh, am excited to hear what, what questions and comments you all you have. 
Thank you so much, Alex. Um, that was a wonderful overview of your of your book. Um, and we have tons of questions from the audience. So I'm going to dive right in. Um, several of the questions uh, revolve around the methodological issues that you and, and argument that you make in your book. And so I'll start there and I'll, I'll ask you a few of those and then give you an opportunity to respond. So one of our audience members asks that or says that you point to various abuses that happen under the categorical approach. But even though balancing may offer flexibility, it's been criticized as being much less friendly to free speech, allowing the courts to balance away First Amendment rights. So this audience member is curious how you might respond to that critique. Great, okay, I, was, I thought we'd get a few questions. I'm happy to do that, yes. Um, I think that that's a very legitimate uh, critique. I think that the libertarian approach is certainly much more uh, permissive uh, and, than the, the European approach but um, and the balancing approach. Uh, but I think that when we look at it less from dogma, less from a pre-World War II Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes conception of the marketplace of ideas will definitely lead, lead to truth. When we remember the effect of speech in Germany prior to the Nazis coming to power, we have to question whether speech should always have the primacy, whether speech should always be the big thumb that, um, uh, of weight. Oftentimes, of course, when it deals with democracy, self-expression, when it deals with the ability, scientific knowledge uh, uh, and, and the like, it, but I think that at least there's a need to look at what other principles are involved in cases for a more fair adjudication of such cases. So continuing along this line or around methodology, several audience members are curious how nuanced context specific balancing would be accomplished from your perspective. Would judges and juries and legislatures be doing the balancing or some combination of those? Um, and then how does that approach keep balancing from being just a wielding of elite power to silence views with which they disagree? I think again, it's another really excellent question, but right now we already have a suppression of uh, the will of the people, right? So what the current status is, is that we don't have campaign finance and reforms in a way that the majority of the public would want them. We don't have a variety of other uh, laws, including privacy laws. There's a real uh, inability to limit the um, uh, 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 corporate gathering of data. So I don't doubt that um, the balancing would have to be done. The balancing I think should be done through, through judges and through juries, the judges giving instructions and the jury is actually assessing the context and the facts. The, uh, the reasoning obviously at the appellate level has to be by judges, but this reasoning that I'm proposing is no different than the one that Justice O'Connor speaks about in her uh, lead opinion to uh, the um, Planned Parenthood v. Casey case. This is what judges do. They do reason judges. They, they, they engage in reason, reasoning, in judgment, rather than these hard and fast rules. So if the hard and fast rules are meant to take the power out of the hands of subjectivity from the judges, and the worry is that in the method I'm proposing, it would be much more subjective. What we're actually getting is cases where judges are striking uh, laws and ideology sometimes plays a role. And they've been accused by their own members of dissenting. As I said, Justice Kagan has said that the court has turned into one where justices in black robes stand in the way of uh, citizens. So we, we have a situation now where I think there is already occurring a judicial supremacy and it would be helpful if greater reasoning could be let out. Is privacy of greater weight than, than speech? Okay, maybe not, but why? Is anonymity by patient of greater weight than for pharmaceutical companies gathering information and trying to feed it to doctors so they know so that they can convince doctors to prescribe more expensive, uh, more expensive drugs? Well, let's balance it out. Let's discuss these issues rather than just make speech a, a hard and fast 
uh, uh, preference. Thanks, Alex. A couple of audience members have questions about your discussion of Rob the Roberts Court. Um, so I'll offer you one and then the, give you a chance to respond and then ask you another question. So one audience member notes that you criticize opinions by Roberts in the Stevens case and then Scalia, Justice Scalia and Brown versus Entertainment Merchants, which makes it seem as if your target are the conservative justices, but it's are there other justices perhaps on the other side of the political, arguably political spectrum who joined those opinions um, and how might that change sort of who you might be targeting with your critique of the Roberts court? Yeah, oh, I, that's, that, that's, a, that's a great question as well. One of the reasons why I think that my direction goes more in its criticism of conservative justices is that the liberal, two, at least two of the liberal justices, that being Justice Kagan and certainly Justice Breyer and Justice Stevens before his retirement, were explicitly open to balance. Right, so just as a function of the individuals on the court, the justices on the court who have identified themselves with balancing are those people who, who we consider to be more liberal justices. Of course, Justice Stevens was appointed by a Republican, but he turned more in the direction of voting with, with uh, liberals. But, it, but it's more than that. So for example, I am completely, I hate to say it, but confused why in McCullen, that's the case about uh, that found that the statute was too narrow in prohibiting anyone from approaching women who were, were uh, seeking services at a pregnancy center. Why it is that Justice Ginsburg did not balance? Why it is that she didn't talk about privacy or Roe v. Wade? And the same goes for Justice Sotomayor. I don't understand that. I mean, privacy, how is it that it's possible to talk about a woman's right to approach a pregnancy center to seek an abortion or to at least seek counseling that might include uh, information about an abortion without mentioning Roe v. Wade or Casey, right? And so there are liberal justices, Ginsburg and, uh, and Justice Sotomayor that I don't, I don't understand why they didn't engage in balancing the case except that they just like Roberts, they just like Kennedy and Scalia are libertarian in their approach. And that really what we have is a uh, philosophy, a constitutional philosophy that runs the gamut of both conservatives and liberals. And that's what I'm challenging because it goes back to Oliver Wendell Holmes and then the interpretation of the marketplace of ideas, another liberal in uh, his descent to the Abrams case. Thank you for that, that nuanced answer, Alex. Um, in Another audience member sort of points to Jamal Green's work, who, as I'm sure our folks in the audience know Jamal Green as a law professor at Columbia. And he's argued that the balancing of proportionality approach is actually, and perhaps somewhat ironically, given the discussion of some of the conservative justices, in fact, more in line with the founders approach to vindicating rights. And I was just curious, um, if you found that in your scholarship that, that, that that's rung true, and if it matters at all to whether or not you would advocate for balancing as compared to uh, the categorical approach? Uh, that's a really fascinating question. I, one I don't think we really have an answer to. Judge Campbell, who used to have be in Morgan Whalen's position and is now at the University of Richmond School, has written uh, the best study, lengthy study, to date about the founders' thoughts on the First Amendment, and he's found that there's too much ambiguity to, to say that there are very clear answers. That doesn't mean that we shouldn't seek those answers. I think we find them more, frankly, uh, from the First Amendment perspective, uh, we find them more in the establishment and free exercise area uh, with James Madison, for example, being very anti-establishment. That's often brought up, another thing that Professor McConnell has written about, um, but uh, that we had much less information about speech and that really begins in the 20th century, which again indicates why the uh, justice, uh, chief, the chief justice's explanation of the source of low value speech, why it is that a certain speech is not protected 
is so narrow and so inaccurate about going back to 1791. But we should use as much historical information as possible that I can, I'm glad to, if people want to email me, I can give them some ideas about how to do so, but at the same time, be realistic about our limitations there. A couple of audience members have asked about uh, your thoughts on social media. So that sort of steps a little bit outside of the presentation that you provided, but um, they're curious. I have a couple of questions for you about First Amendment and social media. So one audience member asks whether if you've written anything about how free speech principles ought to apply to social media generally, not of course, as a matter of First Amendment law, but as a matter of sound social policy. Oh, that's, I, I appreciate that because it allows me to, to have an excuse to advertise my work a little bit more. I have written about the uh, First Amendment in the context of social media from a variety of areas. I've written about terrorism, terrorist speech on the uh, internet, uh, 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 something that came out in Vanderbilt Law Review. Uh, I've also written about um, more recently about which parts of the GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation, which is the new uh, e European Union Data Protection Regulation, which parts of it are compatible with the First Amendment. No one's done that work with me. That's a, an article that came out in just 2019 called Data Subjects Privacy Rights. I've also spoken about privacy and the digital audience in another article that came out in 2019 in Notre Dame called Marketplace of Ideas, Privacy and the Digital Audience. So uh, to, to put it in a nutshell, I'm much more favorable to the European approach to the, uh, these are democracies that, for example, have campaign financing. They allow for uh, certain uh, balancing very overtly that our, uh, it's not our constitution really, it's the interpretation of that constitution by the court has not allowed. And I think we should look to other democracies in order to study them. Not that we should pick their, their approaches, not that we should pick their norms, not that we should pick their social practices and free speech concepts, but rather to learn from them. We should, we should, we should be more open to the values that other democracies present uh, and those really run counter to American libertarianism in this area of the first amendment, free speech. Another audience member asks about, uh, on the same topic of social media, whether you think a law that required private companies, and I'm, I would imagine this person's thinking of Facebook, to set up oversight boards to regulate and possibly remove misleading speech published by third parties, um, on those platforms would be constitutionally permissible. Basically, would it be permissible for a Facebook oversight board to be you know, required by statute? Oh, that it would be required by statute? I think that would be unconstitutional because of Article 3 issues. I think uh, that would uh, allow a private body to engage in uh, a constitutional interpretation and that is way beyond the pale. But do I think it's a good idea? I really, really question it. I, I have good friends on that board. Uh, Pebble Carlin, uh, your, your, your colleague, of course, and Jamal Green, brilliant people uh, from whom I learn every time I pick up something that uh, they write or every time we have a conversation. But I question whether they should be making these decisions. The fact that they just recently thought that there was an ambiguity in Facebook's policies and limiting Donald Trump's speech in the way that uh, Facebook approached it, which I thought was the right way. Not that I agree with all of Facebook's um, approaches. I think a lot of times I'm very critical of them, but in that I thought they were right. But I, I also wonder whether the oversight board is particularly useful because it does not, as far as I've seen, what I've seen of it thus far, it does not have very clear procedural rules, does not have very clear appellate rules, and all of that really puts in, it really limits its, its effectiveness and its value. Okay, great. Um, shifting gears, another set of questions from our audience have to do with speech on campus, which I believe is a topic that you, uh, that you write about in the book. Um, just generally, one, one of our audience members asks, are you worried about the state of free speech on campus? 
Oh, I wish I had, we had more detail on that. I am worried about uh, the state of free speech on campus, both from, somebody asked about the conservative and liberal level, I think from both sides. I, I am concerned that people are being silenced and being required to, to say certain, certain politically correct uh, terms. I am, but I, and I am also concerned with um, the uh, interest of uh, right-wing groups to come on campus and to wreak havoc and to say all sorts of uh, degrading things and think that that's protected speech. So if, if that person wants to follow up with more specificity, I'll be glad to join. And I appreciate that very much, Morgan. You're absolutely right. There's an entire chapter on campus speech in the part of the book that I did not discuss, which as I said, was the second part of the book, and that's one dealing with application. Well, we have another question from a, um, another audience member that provides a little more specificity um, on the same topic. What do you think of the claim often heard on college campuses that even non-threatening speech makes people unsafe? Um, I, I think that's more of a sociological question, but I do think that suppression of speech based on trigger warnings, based on safe spaces is of very little value and a very questionable First Amendment uh, protection because Trigger warnings have been used in some campuses like in Columbia University, tried to suppress Virginia Woolf. Oberlin College tried to suppress Ovid. Uh, their uh, safe spaces have been used to, for segregation. There were calls for safe spaces to include only black floors. And to me, integration is one of the most beautiful things that, and one of the most important normative things that we've done in the United States. And I think we'd be going backwards in that way. Um, I, I hope that that answers the question. Right, right. Thanks, Alex. Another question sort of on a similar, similar type of question. One of our audience members asks about a case before the Supreme Court. Um, I hope I'm not butchering the pronunciation here. Mahoney Area School District, um, which as I'm sure you know, Alex, but for the benefit of our audience, I'll just give a little, a brief overview. This is from SCOTUS blog. The issue is whether Tinker v. Des Moines, uh, which holds that public school officials may regulate speech that would materially and substantially disrupt the work and discipline of the school applies to student speech that occurs off campus. And in that case, there the student speech, the off-campus speech ha has to do with social media um, that students engage speech, social media speech that students engaged in outside of school grounds. And so our audience member is wondering in that case, um, what you think a proportional approach would be and what you'd hope to see the Supreme Court, how you'd hope them to go about thinking through that case using the balancing approach that you advocate for. Oh, that, that, that is uh, really, really uh, great. I, I'm, I'm so grateful for these questions because they're really helping uh, to uh, lay out my argument more and the nuances of it. So um, there, I, I believe, and I, this is another chapter in the book, it deals with student speech from K through 12. Before we were talking about campus speech, this is K through 12 speech, kindergarten through 12th grade. And I do think, that the court's cases, well, I guess, let me answer the question immediately rather than a big windup, and then I'll, I'll, I'll explain after I've given the answer. Um, my impression is that schools should only be governed the, the, their, their campuses, that uh, uh, the material and substantial disruption that Tinker speaks about is only on campus. I question whether, uh, 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 schools as opposed to the police should be the ones who are investigating students. And let me, let me, let me tell you why. So let me give a couple of examples. Well, for one thing, so let me, I guess, before I give the examples, let me say what the case law is and why there's now a question of whether uh, schools can in fact govern con, uh, student speech outside of campus. Obviously cyberbullying, which is a huge problem, but in my opinion, it should be handled by the police, not by the schools, unless it actually substantially and materially disrupts school discipline in which Tinker comes in. But what happened is that there was a case called 
Frederick, in what many of you will know as the Bongs for Jesus case, where kids in, in uh, Fairbanks, Alaska, put up a big sign called Bongs for, for Jesus. I don't know what that exactly means, but you know, the, the court thought certainly was advocacy for drugs and the principal did. And the principal suspended the kid. And uh, you might say, well, that makes sense, right? Well, the, it makes sense if he were on campus, but he wasn't on campus. He was across the street. And she actually had to walk off the campus, uh, off the sidewalk, walk up to him, tear his poster off and say, you're suspended. That seems to me to be going too far. We as kids, I don't know about you, I'll just talk about myself, spoke a lot behind the backs of teachers. We were just kids. We said all sorts of things. We said all sorts of stupid things about each other. And I'm really concerned that kids who are using this interactive source can be, can be followed and can be potentially punished for the rest of their lives with negative repercussions. I'll give you an example. There was a student. He saw a teacher parked by a no parking sign. He was a star player. He had, he had great opportunities for scholarships. He was exceptional at, at uh, it's a sport, I think it was basketball, and it had great grades. He was suspended. His chances at university went way down. Why? Because he texted a photograph of this teacher parked by a no parking sign, off campus speech. Another one, a young woman told her, her she wanted, she was very upset about her teachers preventing um, the, um, uh, this rock festival, rock and roll festival on campus. They were gonna have it later. She, so she said to her, uh, uh, to her fellow classmates, write emails to our principal and to another member of the administration. And, and she called them douchebags. Well, I mean, of course, it's very unsocial to call someone such a name, especially a teacher, but should she get punished? She was punished. Another, another example, a girl wore a, a bracelet on her hand that her mother who was a survivor of breast cancer gave her. The, the, uh, the bracelet said, I love boobies. The girl was suspended. Why? Because the school thought it was obscene speech. I'm telling you, these are all circuit court cases. These are all courts of appeals where, where the suppression of off-campus speech, and in that case, it was really even on-campus speech with the bracelet she wore, was suppressed by the school. I think a balancing is necessary. Here, we, I do think children's civic identity is formed through school. Their self-identity is often formed by stupid comments. We make stupid comments and then we think back and we say, you know what, this is not the person I want to be. This is not the person my parents raised me up to be. And, uh, and, and we improve. And, but we should be allowed our mistakes as children. And so I think Mahoney should limit um, the ability of schools to regulate uh, school children's speech off campus. Well, alas, uh, uh, we have a time, place, and manner restriction as well, um, but not a content-based one, but it, it is time for us to, to stop. And I just really appreciate uh, the chance to I hear your uh, balanced uh, reflections on uh, this uh, difficult subject and wish we had more time to engage in person. Uh, but please uh, just let me uh, ask the audience uh, virtually uh, to join me uh, in, in applause for thanking uh, Alex Sessis for that uh, stimulating talk. Thank you so much for having me. I am deeply grateful to uh, Michael and Morgan for inviting me and to you, the audience, for spending some of your evening with me. Uh, thank you very much. Morgan, would you please uh, issue a, an advertisement, commercial speech uh, for our next event? Gladly. On February 18th of Thursday, same time, same place, we'll be speaking with Russ Feingold, the president of the American Constitution Society, former senator, and affiliate at our center. Michael and Russ will be speaking about bipartisanship, which is particularly salient, uh, I think, in this political moment. So we hope you can join us then. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks for attending. And most of all, thank you, Alex, for that uh, fascinating talk. Thank you.